mid to large sized seven seat SUV is nothing new, but one with a proper full hybrid engine that you don't have to plug in is a great deal rarer. That's what's on offer from Toyota's Highlander. Does any car in this class make more sense than this one? That's what we're here to find out. Basically, the engineering here is borrowed from a Toyota Camry, including the TNGA K Global Architecture Platform and the 2.5 litre Atkinson Cycle full hybrid petrol engine, which features electric motors mounted on both axles. Uh, the rear motor operates the variable all wheel drive system, although you shouldn't consider uh, this to be a really capable off roader. Uh, choose the Land Cruiser if you want that. Light tracks are well within this Highlander's remit, though uh, indeed there is a selectable trail function amongst the driving modes. Uh, in addition, uh, there's an electric-only EV mode. Uh, that won't take you actually very far, uh, just over a mile, but it does differentiate this Toyota's full hybrid power plant from the mild hybrid units, which can never run independently on electric power. Full hybrid tech isn't about zero emissions range by Toyota's RAV4 plug-in model for that. Instead, it's about electrified elements constantly chipping in to help the petrol power plant. And that happens to such a large extent that for large chunks of time in urban driving, as in a Prius, you won't be consuming any fuel at all. The four-cylinder engine develops 245 brake horsepower and it works via a CVT auto gearbox, uh, changes for which you can speed up by selecting an available sport mode. The two-ton towing capacity isn't quite as good as you'll get on a comparable diesel model, but it's much better than rival full hybrid models from Kia and Hyundai can manage in this segment. As for efficiency, well, there's a best of 39.7 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 160 grams per kilometer of CO2. There is something of a Land Cruiser look here, but also the feel of the kind of big American SUV that this Highland is trying to be. Under the skin, its car-like monocoque construction is a cut above lumbering stateside 4x4s, but it certainly has that kind of imposing, although not especially memorable, pavement presence. Especially here at the front, where this big, bluff, trapezoidally shaped grille dominates, its uh, Toyota-badged chrome strip is almost an afterthought. It's just the sort of thing that's perfect for the parking lot at Walmart. You will need a pretty big space though. This Highlander measures in at only a fraction under five meters in length. At the rear, you get a feel for this car's substantial width, 1930 millimeters, and its height, 1755 mils. As usual, of course, what's more important is what you can't see, the GAK monocoque chassis we referenced earlier on. Now this borrows from the Toyota TNGA global architecture the brand uses these days, and that means it's a world away from the clunky body on frame underpinnings of a Land Cruiser. Stepping up into the driver's seat has something of the feel you'll get with that classic global Toyota SUV though. as does the feel you get from the way that you're commandingly positioned behind the wheel. Some of that's down not only to the height of your perch, but to the solid, durable and rather old school cabin feel. There's nothing particularly trendy in terms of design, no digital instrument binnacle screen or silly touch sensitive controls. You don't even get the kind of big central multimedia display that's currently in vogue. This one is just eight inches in size, although it's rather basic graphics do provide most of what you'll need and there is navigation and standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration. Uh, anything that you can't find here will probably feature somewhere in the instrument binnacle that you view through this nice chunky three-spoke wheel. Uh, one of the defiantly analog blue needle dials as usual on a Toyota hybrid is a hybrid power meter uh, to the right of which sits a seven inch TFT multi-information screen and you control that via these buttons on the left hand steering wheel spoke. What else? Um, well, the soft, wide, leather upholstered, heated and power adjustable seats are the kind of chairs that you'd want for a cruise through the Nevada desert or more likely through the next snowy snap. Uh, there's also great all-round visibility. Everything feels built to last. You get lots of cabin stowage and there are nice touches like a rear view mirror, which uh, doubles as a rearward camera. There's also this sliding top between the seats that eases back to reveal a wireless phone charging pad. Time to take a look in the second row. 
where the big squashy seats can trundle forwards and backwards over a 180 millimeter range when you pull on these low corner catches. So unless you're having to compromise your position for the sake of those behind, legroom shouldn't be in short supply. Now cars like this usually require a level of athleticism in reaching their third seating row, which would typically be beyond Granny on her Sunday afternoon trip to the garden center. But this one's not too bad. You can enter from either side, but there is a wider entrance aperture on the driver's side, and that's accessed after a pull on this seat base catch, which allows you to push the bench forward. Once here in the very back, you'll be thankful for the body shape's boxy dimensions. Headroom's fine, even for quite tall adults. Predictably though, knee and legroom isn't, unless you have a particularly accommodating set of passengers who are set ahead of you, uh, who are prepared to move their chairs right forward. So as usual in a seven seat SUV, uh, this third row is really most appropriate for those of school age. Right, let's finish with a look at the boot, and that's accessed via this power-operated tailgate. Although it only gets this a hands-free kick sensor if you stretch up to top spec trim level. Uh, the hatch creaks open at arthritic speed to reveal a 268 litre space when all three seating rows are in place, or 332 litres if you load up to the roof. Will the hybrid drive system compromise luggage capacity compared to the class norm, though, once you start folding seats? Well, not really. Uh, most of the time, of course, you're going to be using this car with these third row pews folded into the floor, which gives you a 579 litre boot with the middle bench slid to its rearmost point, or 658 litres if the bench is in its mid position. It's 865 litres if you load up to the roof. Fold the centre row down as well, the seat back splits 60-40 and you can increase capacity to 1,177 litres or 1,909 if you load up to the roof. This car is not exciting but there are loads of sensible reasons why you might want one. Diesel-like fuel returns and emissions without diesel-like tax and running cost drawbacks. An interior unaffected by battery placement, unlike many rival PHEV crossovers. And the fact that superb refinement and strong equipment levels also come included. We still wish the Highlander was slightly more affordable and a bit more engaging to drive, but we would understand completely if you wanted one. There really is nothing quite like it in segment, and as selling points go, that's a pretty good place to start.